Hello everyone, my name is Jen and welcome to The Book Refuge. Hi everybody and welcome to another weekly wrap up and today is the first full wrap up for November, right? First full weekly wrap up for November. I have eight books to talk about. Um, two of them are fan fictions but the rest are all books and arcs and all of that so even though we're in the middle of the fan fiction readathon right now if you're not interested in fix don't worry i still read and listened to plenty of other things in there um today is a very like gloomy day today and i'm kind of feeling it though because after i film this i have some projects to work on yes i'm already getting started on both my patrons book boxes for the end of this month i really got to get a move on with those but also um, I need to get started on Christmas presents already, which is just, phew, I don't even want to think about, but if I don't think about them now, I'll be more stressed later on. So I have a few projects to get started on and I have some books to listen to. I have some ARCs or some ALCs as well as I did start The Striker by Anna Huang the other day and I have the audio for that. I'm loving it. I have Jade Legacy to listen to. Uh, I'm scared, but I'm excited at the same time, but I'm also scared. <laughs> Stuff. Let's go ahead and get into this week's books because we have some great ones to talk about, right? So the first thing that I listened to was actually Can I Tell You Something by Holly June Smith. And this was an ALC that I received from Must Love Audio. And I mean, if you are new to this channel, you might not know this, but those of you who aren't, you'll know I'm not big into Christmas novels, okay? I'm not big into books that are really any holiday specific. You know, I don't really do that the way some other channels do where they, you know, and I love my friends do this. This isn't a uh, downside to them. I just don't enjoy it, right? I don't really read many Halloween specific ones or do the like Easter or Valentine's. Like, I just don't do that. Generally, I tend to just want to read a really good story and if it happens to have a holiday like in it that's cool but however this one I was very intrigued with since it was provided as an audiobook uh ALC here because um oh shoot I forgot to add something there because the story is actually about an erotic voice like narrator that's what the story is about and our heroine has her like favorite erotic creator that she is subscribed to him and listens to all of his stuff and is really into that and for the holidays she goes to stay with her at her family's like uh holiday house is it in switzerland or something i can't even remember what, like i don't know where it was but they'll always go there and the last two years her brother hasn't been able to be there so she just looks forward to two weeks staying there with her family they go skiing they enjoy everything it's great but um as a surprise her brother does end up meeting them there for the holidays and he brings his roommate who happens to be Cam, who is also Mac and Please, is the name of this voice narrator's name, right? And as soon as she meets him, she knows who he is. Because he's a guy, too, where he doesn't only do his voice, right? Like, a couple weeks ago, or was it last month, I read Just Between Us by Lena Hendricks, right? Where the guy doesn't show his face, although he shows his tattoos, which gives him away, right? But this guy, he does show his face to people. He just keeps a separate persona to protect him, um, which again, if you are someone who's really into narrators, you like know narrators who do this. So definitely very written based on like the research of it. But anyway, he's been doing this and he, but he's also a sound tech in Hollywood and that's what him and his friend, the friend being the brother of our heroine do. And she is subscribed to him. She has actually done something that becomes very embarrassing for her is when she is drunk sometimes she will dm this celebrity to her he's a celebrity but he's never looked at these dms she's only sent them when she's drunk as kind of like appreciation to him of like wow that one was really great like you just hit the spot like all of those type of things so 
when he shows up at the holiday thing, he gets this, like, not hostility from her, but a lot of just, like, she's really pulling away from him when he meets her, and he thinks she's really cute, and he it just doesn't understand what that vibe is that he's getting off of her, because she's so embarrassed, and she's like, oh my god, I know his boy, like, I masturbate to him all the time, like, she's just feeling all those things, right? So she uh, is super embarrassed about this and not too long into the stay, he actually like looks her up on, on Instagram to find out more about her because he is really into her and he knows he shouldn't mess with his friend's sister, but he's, he's into her. And when he looks her up, he notices that, what does it say? Instead of follow on her Instagram, it says follow back, right? Which, uh, so he does. And when he goes into the messagings, he has just tons of these drunk messages from her. And so now he knows that she knows who he is. And now we're in for a fun time. Okay. So that's enough of the explanation. This wasn't a super long one, right? It's only, this was an ebook first, which was kind of funny to me because the way it was written, I was, I wouldn't have been surprised if this was one of those that was like an audio first, but it was, um, an ebook first so you can snag it. Um, but this one is Hannah is the name of our heroine and Cam is the hero. And what I really loved about it is that I don't always jive with, as I said, holiday novellas. Now, technically this is listed as a holiday novella. It is 230 pages, but a lot of the pages are with like, they're with like text messages or they are his little like voice clips, which again, if you're reading it, is just a little transcript giving you an example of how he talks to the people, to his customers, as it were, his fans. Um, so yeah, but I thought it was really great. This was very sex positive. This was very sex worker positive, especially in our new age of them that there are. It also has some good commentary on like what our boundaries need to be with narrators and with people who have public persona, like just enough that it doesn't feel like you're being preached at, but also the common sense that I think when we get very whipped up by someone, and you know what I mean, I am meaning like when we get very like sexually attracted to someone's voice or even their face, because he is also very good looking, he shows his face. This isn't a narrator who has to hide how they look and they never should, but we do know that sometimes when we see certain narrators, it's not that there's anything wrong with how they look, but they don't always look how they sound and that can mess with us because as women, I mean, the fantasy is everything, right, in these. So anyway, I'm talking about this one for way too long, but I just loved it because it was very positive in all of those ways. Because it's a novella, we don't really have a conflict besides the fact that, you know, it's a holiday romance. She lives in London and he lives in California. They have distance, so if this is gonna work out, things are gonna have to change. Like, how is his friend gonna feel? I thought it was great. I loved her parents parents are very supportive, open-minded people. I loved that they were at like this ski resort and yeah, obviously the sexy times were, were really good. But even for this being like he is an erotic narrator, this wasn't like only sex in this book. Like it's hard for me to explain it because I don't want to spoil every little thing, but it was just really wonderful. So the narrators for this, of course, that's very important. We had Adam Gold who was as his name says, he was gold, like he sold this so well. And then we have Evelyn Rose. Um, this was also narrated in duet style, so that was wonderful. So yeah, best friend's brother, holiday romance, forced proximity, and it was just really wonderful. When I was done with it, I was like, I don't have any complaints, so I gave it five stars. And again, this wasn't the spiciest thing I've ever read, so it was about at a three, because it isn't only that in there, but there are some fun little spicy things, particularly the epilogue where we see how their relationship has like evolved now was a really cute. Um, so yeah, there's some actual mutual spanking in this one. It's one of those where he's like, before I do something to you, I want you to see what it's like when you do it to someone. I wish that happened more in books besides outside of like a BDSM one, because there is something super hot about a guy who likes it when he gets a little slap too. Like I'm just, it was, it was good. And then there is, I think there's some toys used in here too. It was great. So anyway, five out of five, I had a wonderful time. And I think that you will too, particularly if you love audiobooks. but again, you can read this one too. You don't have to listen to it. I think it would take a little bit of the 
fun out of it because it's written to be listened to but it was really good and I believe it's already available because yeah we got an ALC of this and it's already available now so you can get it okay so I read changes and this is by Sirius Miney so this is a Sirius Black and Hermione fan fiction this one is an accidental pregnancy but it's also mutual pining and it's friends godfather right this also had great side characters because it has a is it Harry and Theo side pairing? Is that what the side pairing was? I don't know, but it, that was really cute. But basically in this one too, um, Sirius is like a mechanic now. He like works on his bike and he's tattooed and he has a man bun. Like, oh, I was so getting like zaddy vibes out of him. Like I was driving it, but he's very much been pining over Hermione for the past few years. I won't spoil it, but there was a specific event where um, she does something very compassionate for him and he hasn't forgot it. And now he's kind of been fixated on her for this time. And little does he know, she also has been thinking about him. And I think it's after like Harry's birthday or someone's birthday. I can't remember quite which. They end up hooking up and the next morning, you know, it's awkward and he's ready to like talk about what they just uh, did and Hermione's like we can't ever talk about this like I'm so sorry I don't want to ruin anything we can't talk blah blah and so he is like oh I was a mistake to her and she mostly did that out of fear out of fear of what like Harry would think and things like that so it's very like I've really felt for her that she was panicking like that but uh, because it's an accidental pregnancy she does discover what's up and she does not wait long to tell him which I loved and <clears throat> he immediately wants to be involved and they end up moving in together for this so this was a like decent length one it wasn't super super long but it was like 250 pages so like long enough for there to be a story and this also wasn't an erotic romance this really was like a friends to lovers situation um and mutual pining and neither one of them feeling like they're good enough for the other but just enough that it isn't you know it didn't it doesn't drag on too long okay and you know what I mean if you enjoy fan fiction sometimes it can sometimes it can drag on too long right so I don't rate fix anymore, right? Uh, I have it rated for myself. The way that I share this is I do recommend it highly. We'll do it that way. You know, like when you do those surveys, like, do you not recommend? Do you really not recommend? Are you neutral? Do you recommend or highly recommend? That's like my scale now for these. And I do highly recommend this one, particularly if you love accidental pregnancies, you love forbidden romance, but it also isn't overly angsty. Okay. There's not it's not the case of like there being lots of things holding them apart besides their own kind of like unsure if it should happen, right? Okay, then ooh, I got to read an arc of Braving the Storm by Elliot Rose. So I, you guys know, Chasing the Wild was one of my honorable mentions from last month. I really enjoyed that one. I thought it was so sexy. I just, mm, mwah, mwah, I loved it a lot. And I had read that one because number one, it was gifted to me. Number two, I knew it was like a forbidden cowboy romance. And number three, I had seen what the tropes were going to be for this one, which I'll get to in a second. And I was like, I better read Chasing the, Storm, or Ch Chasing the Wild so I can get to Braving the Storm. So I did get an arc from Luna Literary Management. And I will be getting a physical arc of this too, but I couldn't wait for it. Like I was going to try to wait so that I could like read the physical copy and everything but I couldn't and I'm glad I didn't because this was a delight so the taboo tropes in this one are this is an adopted uncle niece situation I believe he's 14 years older than her he was adopted um you know well yeah he was adopted by her grandparents and our heroine hasn't seen him since she was a teenager he was a professional bull rider and now he has retired and he is a farrier on Crimson Ridge, right? So he's friends with our hero from the previous one. We met him in that situation. And he is, yeah, he's a farrier up there. Now, when he comes home one day, 
he finds that there is someone staying at his cabin. And at first he thinks it's a buckle bunny, right, from the past because he's had women show, I mean, apparently they've showed up there before. I don't know how, like, much that happens maybe it's someone from town and the opening situation Elliot Rose does go big or go home guys okay because he gets there and there's someone there using his bathroom and immediately his head goes to he's like okay if this is a buckle bunny I'm gonna get what I want out of it and then I'm gonna kick her off my mountain he's like you showed up in my house you knew what you were here for let's go so he literally is stalking through his cabin and there's a naked woman in his bathroom bent over the counter and he's literally ready to like shove it in as soon as he walks in okay that's gonna off put some people <laughs> but also when you walk through it in his mind he like has no doubt and then he sees the back ass of this girl and he's in it so as I said or maybe I didn't this is an erotic romance I'm just gonna put it out there the first one wasn't quite tipping into the erotic romance level but this one is this one definitely is so just be prepared for that it's not even as it's definitely not as slow burn as the first one was um and just be prepared for that because yeah he walks in but this is also played slightly for comedic aspect because he gets in he like spanks that ass and he's like you know what you're here for and then he looks at her in the mirror and she says uncle storm when his dick is about to go in <laughs> so he's horrified realizes this is his niece um from his estranged brother and again adopted like we'll be clear you guys get it because a part of the taboo is the like they play up you know when they dirty talk they play up him saying uncle but she did not grow up by him he wasn't even adopted till she was in late teens and already like almost an adult and she hasn't seen him all this time and, um, yeah, so now she's there and there are quite a few things that we find out. So her father had died and we know that she is at odds with her family. She is in a very, like, she's lived in an abusive home, particularly emotionally and like degradingly manipulative. We don't immediately know the whole sides of that and everything and I won't spoil it but for sure we know that like her sister's very manipulative she has an ex who's very manipulative and her father was very manipulative however in his will she discovers that she was left a piece of land and like a cabin on Crimson Ridge the very cabin that Storm is living in now I won't go into like how well that happened but to her mind she thought that this is her cabin. Now, she was being very naive in the fact of, like, do you not see that someone was obviously keeping this place up, that someone lives here right now? Her, she is from a very privileged home. Uh, so she just thought someone always kept it up. I don't know. Anyway, we won't go into all those details. But Storm is like, this is my place. I live here. And so she explains a little bit of what's happening. And he ends up agreeing, like, you can stay here. Now, there's only one bed. It's like a one main room, one bedroom, one bathroom type of cabin. And so she ends up, she's like, I need a place to be. And after him being very grumpy, mostly because he's super attracted to her, right? And this is very like conflicting for both of them to be having these feels. He's like, well, you'll stay here. So she's sleeping in the bed. He's sleeping on the couch. And she's just, she's very isolated for being someone who was raised with money and in a big city she's very emotionally isolated and just it's hard to see so she does very much cling to him in that way too where like she goes with him when he goes to ferrying jobs and that's how she meets you know she meets our other characters we know um but yeah and so eventually of course like the sexual tension is going to build over with them and we get into the type of sexy relationship that they have um this ends up being a bdsm relationship for them which involves some free use play going on i know some of you really like that and the way it goes in here is that instead of collaring her he does call her but he uses a leather cuff and so this leather cuff is basically like her collar right so anytime she is open to sexual stuff with him she has her cuff on and that is her 
acceptance, right? As with any free use, when it's safety, like she still has a safe word if she ever doesn't want to, but her putting the cuff on is like, if they're in the middle of doing anything, he can just have her whenever he wants. He can edge her as much as he wants, like all of those sexy things that can come with free use, right? Um, there's also things of like hand necklaces being used. And this is super hot because this guy has his name like tattooed on his hand. So when he like will do that, like his name is on her throat, like it's hot, you guys. Like, whoo, this one was hot. But it was surprisingly emotional in parts too, right? Like any good romance does as we find out the full picture of what she ran away from and also the history of why he's estranged from this family that adopted him in how do we end up like this um there's a there's a lot going on with this one so I won't tell you every single trigger warning I'll tell you a couple Elliot Rose does a very good job listing them all right so this isn't the situation I've had with some books lately where these things aren't covered she has a list of basic trigger warnings and then if you go to the end of the book, it has in detail what she means by those, right? So you can have the overview ones and you can have that. So I'm going to give you the overview ones. And then when you get it and you have it in your hands, you can read those. Okay. So the over the top ones are there's death of parents, like different, both like his and hers. There is suicide mentioned off page. There's suicidal ideation mentioned. There is blood and mental health discussions there's negligent and manipulative family and uh significant others so there's those things going on spicy fun times include free use squirting toys hand necklaces cock warming degradation and dp using a toy okay so jen likes all of these things a lot and i genuinely like storm as a hero more than i liked um Oh, I just forgot his name more than the hero from the first one. Uh, part of that is that Storm doesn't have the same type of guilt going on, right? Like the hero in book one, he's he is worried about his relationship with his son. Storm doesn't give a fuck about the adoptive family he has left, right? And there's reasons for that. So the only taboo in this one is a bit of their like, you know, society's thoughts on, you know, should you be with your adopted relative at all? Um, and then some other drama that's our third act but this doesn't have a third act breakup that doesn't mean there's not a third act conflict or a third act separation but there's not it's not a third act breakup and i honestly was i really loved briar this heroine and the journey she goes on because there are parts of her that feel pretty pathetic in the beginning right it's like poor little rich girl must be so tough all of these things right but everybody has a story and like this woman has a story and we get to see her grow and by the end we get to see her take her power back and it was great so loved it the next one in here is gonna be a uh i mean i don't even want to say i'm very intrigued by what it's gonna be but we do meet who the next couple is gonna be and for sure the fourth book, I'm just, for sure that fourth book is going to be Casey's. I just know it's going to be Casey's because he's redeemed even like more in this one, right? So Casey was the son from the ex-boyfriend's uh, dad one, right? And I love when that happens, okay? I've read that a, a few times where like the, the boyfriend who's the ex like gets redeemed. And honestly, Casey is redeeming himself through this too, which is great. So yeah, I gave this five stars um, and it was a four, four and a half on the spice scale uh, for sure. And then again, remember this one is an erotic romance. There's a lot of their emotional growth is happening through the sexual situations and it's also very sexy. So even more so than Chasing the Wild was. All right, next up I had another fic, um, but I'll just tell you this one quick. This was a big fail. This one is a, I do not recommend. Okay. So one of the things is that I hadn't picked an LGBTQ plus fic yet for my board because I wanted to see what everyone else was reading. Um, I had some dreary saved up. I had some, uh, Charlie and, uh, not just try. I had a, I had some saved up, but I want to see what everyone was reading. And after reading a serious Hermione one, I actually thought I was like, "Ooh, what if there was a serious Harry pairing, right? Like a Godfather, Godson one when they were adults? I'd be like, that could be a good forbidden romance. I was in the mood, right? After reading, honestly, like Braving the Storm and reading that serious Hermione, I was like, "Ooh." So I looked some up, and. One of the things that I discovered, because it, I had found like four or five of these serious and hairy fics, and 
a lot of them are underage ones. And I, I didn't think that through too well. I mean, I wanted the Forbidden Godfather one, but I was thinking the like, you know, he's an adult now. And that is not the case for a lot of these. Okay. And so this one that I, one of them I had started, I immediately realized it was underage and I was like, no. And they do put these content warnings everywhere. Okay. I'm just not used to looking for an underage content warning, right? That's not, I haven't run into that really at all in these, you know, um, the few fix I've read where there's anyone underage, they always age up beforehand, right? Mm. But this one, Woven in Golden Memory by Night Wolf Art, this had underage Harry and it was only 55 pages. So since I didn't realize his age until I was 20 pages in already, I did just finish it and I did not like it, right? So again, I'm not telling you the rating I rated this, but I don't recommend it. And I was pretty icked out by that. Like, I'm just telling you. And I'm, that's not a complete shade to the author. People can write whatever type of forbidden stories they want within fan fiction, and I'm not here to judge them for it. I just don't want to put it into my head because I have lines, and that level of underageness is a big line for me, okay? Big, big one. But moving along, I did a reread of Married by Morning. Sorry, my bright light's going to make this one difficult because it's a white book. Come on. See if I hide my face, does that help? Ooh, there we go. Okay, so Married by Morning by Lisa Claypez. This is book four in The Hathaways, and I reread this one and annotated it for a patron, which was wonderful. I loved rereading it. So um, this one is Leo, who is the brother in the family, who has been a bit of a fuck up through this. He does have a lot of grief in his heart after losing his fiance to an illness, and he's felt like he's haunted by her, honestly. We see that happen in earlier books. He is addicted to opium. He's not behaving well. But in book two in the series, right, he actually goes away with Wynn to help with her health, and he gets healthy too. And so now he's back and he has been back for a few years. And there's Catherine Marks, who's actually a governess for Poppy and Beatrix. And now she's just the governess for Beatrix. And Catherine is also Harry, uh, what's his face? I can't remember his, I just forgot the name, but Harry's um, half sister. And we discovered that in, I believe his book, we find that out. So now we have Catherine and Leo's book and these two have been at each other's throats like the whole time she's worked for them and the whole family knows they're bantering really really hard and so things really pick up in this one there is a lot of teasing that goes back and forth between the two of them and then there's this event where they actually like we find so we find out that Leo needs to be married with and have an heir by the time he's been the is he a Marquess for, I think he's a Marquess, for five years and he only has a year left or else they will lose the house that they've renovated that honestly Cam and Mary Penn and him put a lot of time into um, because there's rule, whatever. You read it, you'll see the historical rules or whatever. And he has no plans on getting married and changing that because he's like, whatever, I don't care. You guys all have a home now. All of his sisters except the youngest have, you know, a husband and they'll be taken care of. And he's like, I don't care. But him and Catherine... Um, sh they end up going to the old part of the estate and they actually fall through a piece of rubble there and Leo actually gets hurt and she and him have to literally drag themselves out of there and get back and then he almost dies from fever and this whole like thing really galvanizes like his feelings for her and he said he doesn't want to marry anyone right he's not interested in getting married no 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 but of course Catherine's the exception but for Catherine she doesn't plan to ever marry anyone she doesn't want any man to have control over her she does not trust men after the life she's grown up and she barely trusts her half brother they've only recently reconciled and she just doesn't trust men at all which definitely understandable for the situation that she's in and so this is a case of him like Leo who thought he didn't want to get married starts pursuing her and he pursues her pretty hard like he is basically hounding her to marry him for big chunks of this book um, trying to woo her with his body trying to woo her with promises of the future and she's just not interested in it 
at all because of her fear or whatever. So he really has to work at dismantling that. So yeah, it was wonderful to revisit this. I will say, um, Catherine just is so dug in on that, right? She's so dug in on it. And I forgot that she literally holds on to it until the last chapter of the book where she's like, I can't get married. I can't do this. I can't, can't, can't. And some people may really relate to that. They, they, re they really might relate to that, but it is frustrating within the story when we have a very likable hero at this point. It very much was like reverse grumpy sunshine. And you're just like, girl, this man loves you. Like, just let him in, you know, that type of thing. So it's a four star read for me. And it's a two, uh, two and a half on the spice scale. Cause they do do it quite a bit in that one. It does happen for sure. Okay. Then we have the songbird and the heart of stone by Carissa Broadbent. Uh, I actually received an e arc of this one a few months ago and I was afraid to read it too early because I wouldn't be able to talk about it at all. And I also just, I was also afraid though of seeing other people's reviews. So I don't know. I was just really nervous because I really love Carissa Broadbent and this is the first time we've got a new book from her, I think in almost two years, I think, because yeah, I believe it was the beginning of 2023. The one came out and then she had maternity leave and then her books were picked up by traditionally published so we have to wait longer to get them so this was kind of the book too that like Bramble almost like launched their stuff on that they had Carissa Broadbent and that these were coming right um so anyway I did receive an e-arc through NatGalley which I was really happy about because I'll tell you I got rejected from uh getting a physical arc I wrote to them begging for one actually I was like I don't care I will I will write to them I got rejected for that because they have very limited amounts right um, and then I got rejected through Edelweiss for one, which I was like, damn it. Um, but I got approved through NetGalley and I was literally like, oh my God. But then as I am, it just sat there cause I have so many fantasy books on my TBR and arcs of them. But I was like, I want to read this before it comes out so that I can review it. But the whole thing is like, I'm not really going to review it here because <laughs> I'm not going to spoil anything for anyone. Um, so I'll just give you a few basic points on it. And then like, I will tell you what I rated it and everything. Um, but also a few suggestions to start with. Number one, there is an appendix, AKA like a glossary of characters that is at the end of this book. I can't remember if it's at the end of the other two. I assume it is, but I didn't grab them off my shelves to look. I highly recommend you read through that before you start it because there are lots of gods in like the pa pa pantheons. There's like a dark and a light pantheon. There's Nyaxia. There's who her dead husband is. There's all the different gods and goddesses. And in this book, they play a bigger part than in the last two, right? Um, and there are a lot of names. It's also one of the things, there's a lot of very similar names. And I hate when that happens in fantasy books. I'm like, can't you pick a different letter to start a name with? Like in the way, you know, I tease in, uh, like Sarah J. Mass does this, there's like Adion and Aelin and like all these names are very similar. And I'm sure there is like language reasons for that. But when you're a fantasy reader, it's confusing for me. Okay. I don't care. And especially when I'm reading an ebook where I can't quickly flip between it's frustrating. So wah, 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 I'm whining, but I'm just telling you that didn't dim my enjoyment of this book. So, but that's just me telling you that you may have an easier time if A, maybe you've only just read the first two books and you're reading this, or B, that you read through that glossary beforehand because it was very helpful, even as a refresher, just knowing, oh, this is the goddess of this. This is the god of this. This is the different houses. There's the blood and the night and the day, like all those different things, right? So there's that. And then this story is about Misha, which i had been saying Mishy. I think I've heard a lot of people say that, but Chris Broadbent obviously knows people are missaying it because her name is pronounced in the beginning of this, we get a pronunciation and it's Misha is what I got. And then we have Asar, who is a god of like the dead kind of situation. And the main thrust of this is that, I mean, we're going to learn a lot more about Misha's history and where she came from, but she did something pretty epic in the previous duet. And that epic thing that she did has a lot of the gods pissed at her. So she's kind of sort of being punished for that. And part of her like, I don't know, reatonement is to go on this journey with Asar, who very much enemies to start with. Um, 
he again is like this scarred like guardian of the dead type thing and they're kind of going through the levels of I don't know purgatory or hell it felt a bit like Dante Inferno like and then having to go through these different layers of the like afterlife the underworld whatever to find pieces of I don't want to tell you what it is pieces of a thing um, to complete a mission for one of the gods okay and this is like a road trip story it takes place over a good amount of time this traveling that they're doing under uh through here and so it's a slow burn between Asar and uh Misha because of that because they very much start out as enemies there is powers that Misha has that she's never really used because of you know she is a vampire but she's a she's one with very conflicted loyalties let's just say that and yeah and this had so anyway that's enough that's enough of that saying on it that's what we're going on um I really loved Misha. One of the things that kept me going through this when there was droller parts, because I will talk about a few of the weaknesses here, is that I loved Misha and I loved being in her point of view. And this is written in, I believe, the same way the first two were, where the first book is like pretty much solely the POV of Misha. And then we get, you know, one POV from Asar. But I'm positive the next book will have both their POVs and I believe that's what happened in the other duet too I think we have Aurea for the first one and then we get Rain's POV added in in the next one so that's gonna happen in this one too so yeah some of the weaknesses of this again is lots of names lots of new worlds we're going through um there were this took me about eight days to get through because each time I would it it was a bit pulling teeth getting through the first good amount of this right and I know that that is a weakness of Chris Broadbent's right and she's not the only one there's a lot of fantasy authors that that's the thing because it's very hard to balance things like that but I remember the first two books though I didn't have that issue with this uh, but I've heard from other friends that they do you know like my sister really struggles with Carissa Broadbent's like her daughter the daughter of no worlds books she has not finished them because she's a dull out of her mind for parts of it um and i know that's a struggle with some of the other ones and to me that is happening in this one too now i have a lot of trust for krista broadbent because i've given books of her six stars before and i did like the first two in this one but i do think because it took you know i haven't read those in 18 months or so if I had just read those ones sooner to this, that might not have happened. If there also wasn't all hell breaking loose in the real world, maybe I would have been more focused as well. So I didn't hold those things against the book. I'm just telling you that, that in reading this, it was. And one of the big parts of that is because Krista Broadbent knows how to end a book. Okay, she does. And one of the things I've always heard this said, I mean, I've heard it said about books, but there's actually a movie reviewer who worded this really well is like people will remember the last feeling you gave them over a lot of the other stuff. It's why, you know, some films get rated very positively that are very dull for lots of parts of it or things like that. You know, it's the last feeling you have. And that's how books are too, right? You, you spend that story slowly getting people invested if you're a good author and then when the shit really starts whipping it up there you are so invested you didn't even realize how you got to that point right and so the end of this one was oh bringing it all out for us like it was it was intense and so the feeling i was left with at the end was a utter devastation b I can't wait to see how people react, like not people reading, the people, the characters in the book react in the next one. Like I'm ready for the, just all the things. And yeah, but I do think that just like any fantasy that's very hyped, there'll be a lot of like split people on this of if they feel it was too dull or this or whatever. But yeah, I enjoyed myself and especially that last 30%, I was really keyed into it. And again, just to read it one more time, there's a few reasons it took me so long to get through that first 70%. It was because I read six books at the same time and there is a lot going on in the world and I wasn't necessarily ready to be lost in this fantasy where we're going through the lands of the dead. Like that's heavy. That's a heavy aspect of it. And there's also a lot of trauma that 
Misha's been through. So let's talk about just quickly a couple of the trigger warnings here is that there's, of course, violence, there's essay, religious trauma, and cult-like behavior, and a lot of those things are mixed together, okay? There is some things that Misha's been put through that she thought were someone showing her love, but they were obviously clearly an abuse of power and cult-like behavior being done. And that was very hard to have to sit through. And some of the deaths in here were a lot. But I really loved Asar. I think a lot of people will. He was great. And yeah, so anyway, that's my review while not really saying anything at all. Um, it was definitely worth it to me. I can't wait to own my own copy of it. It was beautiful. And I ended up at a five star. Um, it wasn't a six star read. It's not the best I've read from her, but I've given most of her books five or six stars. So it sits right in there for me, right? So there this up here. So I beta read a book called Endgame by an author that's going to debut in January. And so I'm not really going to talk about anything to do with that at all because it was a beta read. I think she's going to change some things pretty significantly. This will be a debut author. So I provided as much insight as I could to it. But I will tell you it's going to be a best friend's brother, um, like reverse grumpy sunshine, golden retriever hero, black cat. And it's a sports romance. It's baseball, best friend's brother. Um, very much a like really swoony hero in this one so I will talk more about that when it gets closer to it but I did read that just to let you know it was in there and then I rounded out my reading with an audio of Dear Rosie by SJ Tilly so this book already came out I think like a month and a half ago two months but this was the ALC that I just finished for must love audio this was narrated in do no it wasn't duet it wasn't duet, but it was Andy Arndt and Christian Fox. And this was good. I had a relatively good time with this one. So the setup for this one is that we have Rosie and Nathan, and they knew each other when they were kids. They were next door neighbors. Rosie was eight, he was 12, and they were really close friends. Now, Rosie is in an abusive family. Um, her mother has died, and now she's just in the hands of her father, and he's very, like, currently verbally abusive with her. But as things go on, he gets physically abusive, too. And Nate and her, they will, like, sneak away and meet each other. And then at the start of this book, he's letting her know that he's moving away. His family's moving to Ohio, and I think they lived in Wisconsin and he's going to be moving to Ohio with his family. And Rosie is devastated. This poor little eight year old girl, like it's so sad. And he gives her his new address and is like, write me here. I want you to write me letters and we'll still be friends this way. And so she's like, okay. And it just, as Jake Tilly knows how to pull your hearts, guys, like, oof, this was tough. So this sweet little girl has like no one to turn to. Um, and so she writes a letter to her friend and devastatingly she receives back an undeliverable letter and we it's obvious to us this wasn't on purpose this was a 12 year old who handed off his address and he clearly misdid it so then we skip ahead 25 years I think and is it 25 or 15 I don't know she's eight and now she is in her late, I do think it's 25 years or so. Um, either way, it's a long ways. And Nate is now a retired footballer. Um, it was funny because he used to say he played for Minnesota. We know, it was the Vikings. He played for the Vikings for crying out loud. Just say what he played for. Um, but now they're in Minneapolis. I believe that's where we are. And she is a caterer. And she is catering for a like wedding get together kind of it's a this couple had eloped together but now they're having like a reception at their home. And I believe this is the couple from book one which I actually didn't read book one in this one because I didn't get an arc of that one and then I didn't have time like you guys know how it goes. So um, this was just a duet the love letters duet two books and a novella were in this series. But that couple I believe is the one having it and so Rosie is catering it. And she knows who Nate is now. Um, I won't go into how she discovered who he was or whatever, but, you know, she isn't expecting him to walk in because, like, he's not a football player anymore, but he's still friends with his football player friends, and he owns a tech company, and he's now, like, a billionaire in his own right and all that jazz, right? 
and Rosie recognizes him when he comes in and she's like frozen in place and he's immediately attracted to her and so when he finds out she's a caterer and not like a friend of his friends he wants to like ask her out and one thing leads to another and they actually are like fooling around in the pantry and she accidentally says she calls him Nathan instead of Nate and her she introduced herself as Rosalind but when she says Nathan and then she like runs out of the pantry and leaves it starts clicking for him he's like only one person's ever called me Nathan and then he's like her name is Rosalind is this Ro and so it all clicks for him and then he goes about like oh my gosh this is my childhood friend and for him like he doesn't know he just thinks that she was only eight but he has thought of his friend now and then all these years he wondered whatever happened to her but he didn't ever look for her so that is the setup that is all the beginning of this like that's just the setup and now we have nathan who he wants to get to know her again and she has a lot of pain and a lot of angst that she's went through in the last 25 years and we're gonna see if he's able to overcome that for her so this was good I will say that, as always, with a S.J. Tilly, it's extremely cheesy, okay? I know this is a romance a romance reader saying that, but the cheese factor is real high with this one, okay? And so there would be moments where it is very beautiful and very heavy, and then it would be so cheesy, right? And in my opinion, that works better in her Mafia books. Like, it just does, because, I don't know, Mafia men just are wild like that way. There is actually a cameo of a couple uh, characters though so that was cool you'll run into there's some alliance characters that show up in here um but it would just go from some very heavy stuff like when you see the trigger warnings for this like we have suicidal ideation there's a, a um, abusive parent right there's ptsd stuff going on and so they're very big like swings between super cheesy stuff to that he has a wonderful cat who is adorable we're in love he's a cat dad and like it's so cute and he's a very much a caretaker like a lot of people just gush over this right and i understand because i feel that way about the alliance series like it's completely over the top goofy in some ways but also like i really like it and in this one i don't know it just wasn't quite right and then mixed with the fact that I, would, I just want her to change how she writes it. I know, I should just stop hoping. But she does that thing where she only writes like two sentences for a chapter. And I'll tell you, I've pinpointed to why this bugs me because authors can write however they want, okay? But in, when you read it with your eyes, that's not as distracting when you change chapters that fast because as a reader, you more just, you catalog that we've changed POV as you do it right you know so they're in a sexy scene and we have her pov and then it'll switch to his pov for two sentences to say how much he loves eating her pussy and then it'll switch back to her having an orgasm and it switches so we're like switching povs like this right well when you have to listen to an alc of it every time we change we say the chapter right whereas again when you're reading it the chapters may change but you just kind of slide by it as a reader when you're doing that in a narration there's the end of a chapter pause he says chapter 37 nate and then just reads one sentence about eating her pussy and then we're like chapter 39 rosie go by like it's much more disjointed when you're listening actually than when you're reading so you know i'm reviewing the alc that's what i'm doing so i gotta be honest about like that jolts me out of it a bit when when you're reading it with your eyes it could flow better doesn't flow as nice when you listen so anyway that's just my critique take it or leave it there was also some anal in here toys lots of lube use semi-public sex it's hot we know sj tilly can do that and she will have you crying at the end of it you will ball so all the feels are there i just gotta be honest like it's not my favorite sj tilly and it was so cheesy that it hurt my teeth sometimes so there we go four stars for me three and a half on the spice scale so there you go that will wrap up this week's reading from me and uh yeah i hope you have a great weekend i hope you watch yellowstone if you do and you enjoy it i'm not going to be reviewing every episode of yellowstone but i do react to it on my instagram so if you want reactions for that you can go look at there but thank you so much for watching friends and i hope you have a wonderful week bye